Well, good evening, everybody. It looks as though those of you who've been patiently waiting in the waiting room are now uh, in the auditorium with, uh, with the company. Welcome to the last in this extraordinary series of events in the series hosted for Green College by Michelle Good on the theme of indigenous resurgence and colonial fingerprints in the 21st century. It has been truly an honor for the college uh, to be able to work with Michelle and to welcome so many of you on this occasion and on previous occasions uh, for a series of conversations uh, with extremely uh, well-informed uh, individuals on topics of such pressing uh, and uh, truly historic importance. I am speaking this evening as so often uh, from around Green College from the traditional unceded ancestral lands of the Hunkamining speaking Musqueam people. And uh, without that hospitality, none of the hospitality that Green College uh, extends would be possible. Everything begins from that ground and from that uh, traditional indebtedness of ours as visitors who seem to have stayed over the generations really rather a long time in what is at Green College, a particularly blessed spot of ground. I'm gonna turn this space over now uh, with the usual pleasure and alacrity to Michelle Good, who has, well, not just one, uh, but two guests here this evening. Uh, and Michelle will now make the rest of the arrangements. Michelle Good, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, as Mark says, this is our last event in our, uh, in our adventure this past year in the J.V. Klein Lecture Series, and I'm so pleased that uh, both Sheila Rogers and Kateri Akowensi Dam were able to join us tonight for, um, for a conversation, and I'm really pleased to be concluding this on a literary note, so to speak. And so, although she needs no introduction, I will introduce you to Sheila Rogers. Sheila is a veteran broadcast journalist, is currently the host and producer, a producer of the next chapter on CBC, and uh, which is a program devoted to Canadian literature, to writing in, in Canada. Um, she was an honorary witness to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and that year she was also named to the Order of Canada as an officer for uh, promoting uh, Canadian culture, adult literacy, mental health and truth and reconciliation. In 2016, she received the first ever Margaret Trudeau Award for mental health advocacy. She holds eight honorary doctorates and is the 11th chancellor at the University of Victoria. And she is a member of the Métis Nation of Greater Victoria um, and is speaking with us today from the unceded territory of the Snehobank First Nation, uh, where she lives and describes herself as a grateful visitor. Also, very, very interestingly, um, her great-grandmother, Edith Rogers, was the first woman and the first Métis woman elected to the Manitoba legislature. Um, very interesting history. So I'm so pleased to welcome Sheila and equally pleased to welcome um, Kateri Akwenzi Dam, who is a powerhouse in the Indigenous literature and uh, um, publication world. She um, is Anishinaabe from the Saugeen uh, Ojibwe Nation, the Chippewas of Nawash. I won't even try to pronounce that, but, on, but it is also on the Saugeen Peninsula in southwestern Ontario. She is an assistant professor of creative writing, Indigenous literatures and oral traditions in the English department at the University of Toronto. Scarborough. She is the founder, publisher, and managing editor of Kagadant's Press, an Indigenous publishing company that has been producing literary books for Indigenous writers from across Canada and internationally since 1993. She's a very well-known writer, a spoken word artist, a librettist, which I didn't know, um, and a mentor to writers through her work as publisher, professor, and editor. She's done readings, performances, speaking engagements around the world. Um, her 2015 book of short fiction, The Stone Collection, 
received a starred review from Publishers Weekly and was a finalist for the Sartan Literary Award. She wrote the Globe and Mail opinion piece, the, the cultural appropriation debate is over, it's time for action. The graphic novel Nimki about children caught in the CAS scoops for the anthology of this place, 150 years retold and is working on a second collection of short fiction. Regeneration, the poetry of Kateri Akawenzi Dam, collected and with an introduction by Dallas Hunt, was released this year, and she will be reading one, maybe two poems from that for us today, and I'm very excited about that. She is one of the jurors for the inaugural Indigenous Voices Award, as well as for the 2018 Commonwealth Writers Short Story Awards, and she is the proud mother of two creative, beautiful, and busy boys. And so with that, I will ask Sheila to step into her wheelhouse and have a conversation <laughs> for us with Kateri. Thank you so much, Michelle. And uh, Kateri, it's so lovely to see you. You're very small at the moment, but I guess you'll be bigger when you speak. But uh, it's, it is great to see you. Uh, it's been a long time. Um, I'm trying to remember the last time I saw you. I think it was perhaps at an Aboriginal Healing Foundation dinner. Is that right? That sounds right. Um, before we start, Sheila, I was just wondering if I can please ask the audience who um, who have their cameras on to turn it off. I'm having a little bit of connectivity issues. Mm, thank you for that. That would help. Yeah. yeah. But um, yes, I think that was the last time. And I think, you know, as Michelle read your introduction, uh, and I looked at the introduction um, in, well, it was actually the introduction to the series written by Tannis McDonald. She talks about the people who uh, carry the cultural backpack, and that is definitely you. And I, I wonder, you know, how much of all the things you've been doing, being a judge at the Indigenous Voices Awards, publishing other writers, setting up this publishing company, what kind of um, sacrifice has it been to your own writing? That is uh, something I try not to think about, but it, it really has, I think, um, taken a toll on my ability to work on my own writing. Um, you know, I really was taught to, to give back, um, to help others, you know, um, on both sides of my family, my Anishinaabe and my Polish Canadian side. And I took that to heart in a big way. Um, maybe even too much sometimes, you know, to my own detriment. But um, um, I don't have regrets. I think that, you know, I've been able to um, do as much as I could to help other people to, to, to move Indigenous writing forward, Indigenous literature, Indigenous publishing. And um, I think it's a fair sacrifice to... Um, you know, maybe not be quite as productive. I, I tried to compensate for that by just working a lot <laughs> so that I could maintain my own writing practice as well. But, um, you know, I, I just feel like I want to be part of a wave of, of people moving forward rather than to be the one person that's out in front. That's always been my philosophy. And, and um, that's what I've been trying to do. So I think in many ways, it's it's been a fair trade-off and I'm, I'm pleased with the work I've been able to do. What's it like for you to see your poetry selected uh, at, with an introduction by Dallas Hunt, the wonderful writer, um, all collected in, in this lovely volume? It's surreal, really. I, I, it felt like a bit of a joke at first. Like, it, did they mean me, uh, uh, you know? I think part of it is just denial that I might be at that point in my life and in my career where there's enough um, to collect. But it, I mean, it's it just feels very gratifying. And um, it had this weird impact of, I hadn't been writing poetry for a while and suddenly I was inspired to write poetry during the pandemic when nobody was really doing <laughs> much writing. But um, yeah, it's it's just been uh, it's been wonderful and and humbling and inspiring. Can you talk about the title regeneration? And there are brackets parentheses around the re. 
Yes. Um, so uh, I thought long and hard about what the title would be for the collection. And, and I wanted to, to um, I mean, how do you encap encapsulate years and years of your work? And so I wanted to bring with the title, the idea that, um, that I was just talking about of, of generation after generation leading towards the, the things that I've been able to do and that I'm just part of that, um, that line of people who've been working uh, to bring Indigenous literature forward. And, and, and at the same time, there's that idea of generating, of growth, of, of um, creation, of, of making something um, new. And the regeneration is really um, gesturing towards you know, uh, reclamation of our, of our cultural and traditional knowledge. Um, all of those kind of R words, <laughs> um, except maybe not reconciliation. I'm not sure if we're there yet, but you know, all of these, um, I'm sure we're know, not we're striving yeah. so much to bring things back. No, you, you know, I, I, I don't think I, I never did believe we were ready after my work with the Aboriginal Healing Foundation and the Legacy of Hope Foundation. Um, but I, I wanted to say, you know, that that this is part of that movement to reclaim, to to um, find, you know, uh, restitution and ways to bring what was uh, the foundations for who we are and and our lands and so on to 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 reclaim that to um, and and to bring that with us when we move forward. And so, you know, I, I like playing with words. So it was, you know, that whole idea of reading it either way. And it's also, you know, re, it's about, the, about generations. It's about um, my children and, and, and creating a legacy for those who will follow in our footsteps. Can you talk about, well, of course you can, Kegadon's Press and, and how it began and, and, what role you see it playing in in the resurgence and support and amplification of indigenous literature? Yes, well, um, it started really so many years ago. I think it's getting to be around 30 years now. I hate to say that, admit that, but um, I think it was about 30 years ago that uh, that it started as a way of just contributing to a group of um, indigenous writers that I was a part of. And um, I hope you can still hear me okay. I know my internet is not being cooperative, but um, yeah, it grew out of, it, it grew out of that to become, you know, helping those writers who at the time it started, we were all in Ottawa. We were sort of this, this contained group. And then people started moving back to their home territories and so on. And suddenly it was this big grand thing, this national thing. And um, I took it to heart. I made a promise that I would publish another one of the members of that writers group, Wino, that I would publish one of their books. And it took me years, but I did it. It was Joseph Danderan, Tony Danderan, as we called him back then. And, um, and once I got that far, I was just determined, well, now I've got this imprint. How can I help others to get their work out there? I really saw a need for it. Um, uh, you know, and to, to do something, I, th I think Thetis um, was already there mm -hmm. and doing great work, but I saw a need to do something a little bit different. Um, and, 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 you know, that was on the West Coast to bring something out to the East Coast um, that could maybe have some different ideas about Indigenous literature and maybe closer connections to the people out East. Um, so that's really, you know, how it kind of snowballed into this um, thing that's been going on for decades. Daniel Heath Justice is, he's a good friend of mine. And of course, you published his trilogy, The Way of Thorn and Thunder. And you, you took a chance. You took a chance. This was a very epic uh, fantasy, more than 700 pages long. And, but you're able to do that because you created your own publishing house. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, I purposely didn't want to have a committee, a board that would decide what we were doing. I just wanted to be able to 
uh, use my knowledge of uh, Indigenous literature and, you know, my connections with people to identify some things that I thought were important, that I wanted to pursue, that I wanted to bring forward, um, not for my own you know, purposes, but because I thought it would be really great to really kick at those boundaries that were around Indigenous literature for so long. It was so mischaracterized. It was shelved with Canadiana and so on yeah. in, in um, bookstores and and libraries and so on. And, and I really, you know, so many people thought of it as protest literature or nature literature. Um, and so I, I just wanted to dismantle a lot of that. And I wanted to put forward the idea that that our work is not marginalized, that we cannot be marginalized in our homeland, that we are at the center of things and that we can, um, you know, bring our own uh, literary traditions and aesthetics and, and ways of viewing the world forward. And at the same time, that we can incorporate all these other things that, that we've been forced many times at great cost to ourselves and our families to learn from mainstream culture and from other cultures. You know, we're also citizens of the world. We're, if we really believe um, that we are from nations, then that, that's a natural thing to have relationships with um, other nations and, and, you know, um, and so on. So I wanted to really, um, look at that with the publishing company and find those gaps and find those projects that maybe other people wouldn't take the risk on. But what did I have to lose? My own time, my own resources, um, you know, sometimes my own money. But uh, I thought that was an extremely worthwhile thing to do. And Daniel's project, when I saw that book, I was so blown away by it. Like my, my head exploded when I first opened it and read what he had created it just is so beautiful and so epic, as you say, how could I not? <laughs> I want to be Tarsa. I really want to be Tarsa. And when I read Tarsa, I feel strength. And when I read your poetry, I feel, I mean, I need a cigarette. You know? <laughs> Some of your poetry, it's, you're, you are, you, you go places. <laughs> Some of it. I, I love it too, because this is something you have in common uh, with Michelle, and I, I, I want to ask Michelle about it too, but you, you do not shy away from writing about love in all of its absolute glory, including erotic, including the body, and, and such a celebration of the body. Why has that been important to you? Well... Again, it was a kind of reclamation, uh, a, an attempt to, you know, be on that first wave of resurgence, because I grew up uh, raised in a way that, you know, we had to be so careful about the way we presented ourselves as Indigenous women. And, and um, you know, there was a certain point when Phil Fontaine's story about abuse at residential schools came out, and I was working, doing some work around um, AIDS in the Indigenous community and all these things were coming together and it just felt so sad and negative. And yet my reality was that my grandparents had this amazing, beautiful relationship. Um, and I didn't see that reflected anywhere. And I really had to confront uh, so many things within myself to be able to write erotica. But I knew that for my own healing and for the healing of our communities and our families, that we had to say, you know, that to be fully alive, we have to embrace that part of ourselves. We, we are physical beings and we have to bring that back. We have to be willing to talk about our sexuality, our bodies. And, and you know, some of the, the kitchen conversations and, um, and joking and, and teasing that goes on, that we have to bring that, that out into the open and to let go of some of the fear because there was so much fear from stories like, you know, um, the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls that we heard about, Helen Betty Osborne's story just lodged itself in my heart and has stayed there ever since. Um, you know, and I felt like we need something more. And I, I went searching for erotica, for those love stories, for things that just would make me feel so that vitality and that love that happens in our communities and families. And it was so difficult to find. And I didn't 
I didn't have children at the time, but I didn't want my children and my nieces and nephews to grow up without seeing that side of who we are represented. Um, I wanted them to have those role models. I didn't want them to just know fear. And um, so it was really, really important to me to break through. Uh, I was such a shy child and, you know, and this was really difficult for me considering the way that I was raised um, to be able to do that. But it was really, really healthy uh, for me and for, you know, other people that I talked to, to just say, yes, it's time. We, we have to be willing to embrace all aspects of who we are. And um, so that was a really, really, for me, a very important part of it. And such a celebration as well. Would you read a poem for us? Yes. <laughs> um, I will. I, the one I picked out is not very erotic, but <laughs> um, I did have one that I, I thought um, would be a good one to start with. Maybe I'll change my mind later if I get a second chance. Um, this one is called Telling Story. And I thought it was apt for what we're doing here. Telling story. When she pulled me under, I remember clawing at lake bed. Rocks smashing against rocks, small bubbles of air rushing past my eyes. I tried holding my breath. Then claws that were not claws pulling me down. The flash of iridescent green, a yellow eye watching. Calm and cool as I was collected, like the stones I had been gathering at the shore. And the sudden thought that I was being pulled into story pushed the last breath from my lungs. That's beautiful, Kateri. <sighs> Shivery. Being, yeah, yeah, pulled into story. And, and maybe this is the moment we pull Michelle into the story as well. But, well, uh, I'm going to, I have a question for Kateri too, um, before you pull me in. <laughs> um, it, you know, this work that you've done, and as you say, over 30 years, and, uh, you know, in, in, I guess, claiming our space and our right to tell our own stories. Um, how do you feel? Well, I think I know, but I'd like you to tell us how you feel about the fact that we are still coping with, you know, every, it seems every week there is a new pretendium that is outed, um, either in the literary world or the academic world and so on. And after all this work that you've put into, um, you know, claiming our space, how, how does that make you feel? Um. It's extremely frustrating. Uh, you know, it, it, it feels like, um, you know, like in a story, like we've clawed our way uh, towards something. We've worked so hard, not just me, but, but generations before me to, to, to get things back, to make those spaces, to make room. And then other people are coming along and, and um, taking advantage of all of that work. For their own purposes and so um it's been it's been extremely frustrating to watch that unfold and to realize that as part of the work that i do that i have to be cognizant of of um of that possibility and and with the work that we're publishing that you know we're more aware that that possibility exists that you know um that we'll have to confront these kinds of issues in the work that we do and it's, it's very disappointing, it's very challenging, and it takes us away from the things that we actually want to be doing. Um, and that's the part that is, for me, the, the most bitter pill to swallow, is that I have other things that I want to accomplish, and I'm being sidetracked, and my time, which increasingly I feel is valuable, and that I really want to dedicate to the things that are the most important to me, including my sons, um, that it pulls me away from all of that. And, and so I, it saddens me and, and I resent it. Yeah, me too. Mm. Earlier, um, there was the mention of enough debate about appropriation of voice. I wonder why we even had a debate about stealing voices to begin with. But what, if you want to take action, what kind of action 
can be taken. Is that to both of us? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'll start. Well, Kateri, you start. <laughs> I think that... Go first, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that there has to be a conversation, um, you know, especially because of the rampant presence of pretendianism in the academy, that there has to be a conversation about indigeneity being a, a, a real qualification. It's a qualification to that you must have to tell Indigenous story, to teach Indigenous knowledge. It's a qualification that you must have. And the way I feel about it is like, if I were to apply for a position at a university, right, they would say, do you have a PhD? And let's pretend I do. And I would say, yes, I have a PhD. And then they would make me prove that I had a PhD. I would have to, I would have to produce the paper, the documentation, all of that that says, I have a PhD. But with indigeneity, a person can simply, anybody can self-identify and the university just, okay, great. You know, we've got that box checked, indigenous sticker on your forehead, let's go. And the, there is no investment in the truth. There's no investment in the academy, and I'm speaking in general terms, of course, um, in recognizing that indigeneity is as much a qualification as any other qualification, and that there has to be authentication of indigeneity for those kinds of positions, and also for people that are that are writing as though they are indigenous, um, they must be, and there's just no excuse for it. And it's my, it's close to the top of my pet peeve list right now. In case you haven't noticed. <laughs> Okay, you go, Kateri. <laughs> well, you know, now I'm I'm in a university setting, and so I see some of this being played out. And what comes to my mind, first of all, is that um, it's not the job of universities to define indigeneity. It's their job to do the research and find the the experts who can provide that guidance for them. Um, so, you know, no one can tell me that I have to accept somebody as being an Anishinaabe when I, you know, see that they're not. Um, that's nobody's place, but, but Anishinaabe communities to decide that. Um, and we might, as na nations, have differences of opinion about how that's done or, or the nuances of it. But I think, um, and I hope what we can all agree on is that that's, um, that's within our our rights as self-determining um, Indigenous peoples to do that. And institutions, and especially colonial institutions, shouldn't be doing that. What universities are doing is not much different um, than the Indian Act, except they were trying to limit who could do it. And the universities are kind of having the opposite effect where they're letting everybody in. And what that, in effect, does is push other people out. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I... I I'm watching um, and doing what I can uh, as well in that area to, to um, you know, present different points of view about what the, what universities can be doing. And in terms of other actions, I mean, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to be aware of these issues, to, you know, to stop debating, um, you know, the stealing of stories mm -hmm. and, and really start supporting, um, you know, putting that, that effort and that energy behind uh, th those kinds of um, efforts that are happening, that are coming from our communities, coming from our people, coming from our urban, uh, you know, organizations and so on that are working with us and, and redirecting that energy somewhere else uh, instead of um, this debate, you know, when, when it started years ago, it w was one of my cousins who wrote to uh, a Globe and Mail editorial about it. I've written one. I don't want to see one of my cousins, you know, uh, 30 years later having to write the same thing. So I think there's a lot that can be done to support um, the efforts of Indigenous people to um, protect their, their stories, to protect their communities, uh, to protect culturally the things that matter to us, um, our traditional knowledge and so on. So that's, you know, 
a very fast answer to a big question, but <laughs> that's w the way I'm looking at it today. Thank you. Thank you both for, for your answer. I, I want to pull a, a, a big turn, a very dramatic turn, and ask you both about poetry. Because, Michelle, I found out this summer when we were roommates at the Writers at Woody Point Festival that you were studying poetry with George Murray at one point. Yes. And I, you know, I, do you have poetry in, in with you right now? <laughs> I just moved. No, I, I don't I have know, any poetry with me right now. <laughs> but but what was well, the impulse to study poetry? Well, I think I've been writing poetry since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've always, you know, it, that was where I began, actually. My writing was poetry before mm -hmm. I started anything else that I, uh, in my writing career, so to speak, um, my... <laughs> my emerging writer career. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. So, and that was, uh, I, I wrote, uh, and I had some success. I mean, I, I, I wrote one, one poem in current times when I was working with George and, uh, and, uh, and it was um, included in best Canadian poetry. And then the next year in best of the best Canadian poetry, which kind of blew me away. But uh, um you know it's it, it it i would love to go back and write a book of poetry um after i finish this list of things i have to do um but one day one day i will i said that you studied uh with george murray but george would argue he studied with you uh, and that, <laughs> that you t you taught him a lot well you know george is a very very interesting intelligent and sweet man so he is, yeah, he is. Who, who, I, who doesn't know his own strength. He's, uh, he's an excellent teacher and an excellent poet. Yeah. Kateri, uh, what about you and the, the impulse to write poetry? I mean, then does it go back to your childhood as it does for Michelle? It does. I grew up with um, a grandmother, my Anishinaabe grandmother, who just loved to read. She was a voracious reader. Her house, uh, my grandparents' house was filled with books. And she loved to write. She wrote columns for the local newspapers and she wrote poetry. Um, not a lot of poetry, but she did. And so, um, you know, I liked that aspect of it. I did not, you know, like everyone, probably I didn't overly <laughs> love the poetry that I was being taught at school. Um, it didn't resonate for me, except that I really enjoyed words. And I loved the idea of playing with words, but I, you know, a lot of it was um, out of my realm of experience and understanding. Uh, yeah, but it does go, it goes way back. Would you read another poem for us? Sure. I feel like I should be reading some erotic poetry in it since you brought it up, but I, I'm not going to. <laughs> Just because uh, I'm not really sure what to read. Um, another time, maybe. Uh, I, I'm, I'm reading some of my newer poems that are included in the book. So um, this one is called Boil Water Advisory. Um, and I think it's so relevant to some of the issues that are um, have been happening over the years with, um, in, you know, Indigenous um, water, you know, in first so boil water advisory boil water for tea add leaves make it strong before you serve it sprinkle it with cold river water you won't even taste the mercury or the fish not even the deformed ones but if you do add something sweet maple syrup is best if the forest still stands Otherwise, just ignore the clear cut. Use the refined white stuff you bought in town for two beaver skins and the last known speaker of your language. After all, diabetes is better than the constant ache of colonialism. Very powerful. I, I want to ask you how much how much anger and frustration fuels your writing? 
Oh, I think we've got a frozen cattery. Oh, that's too um, bad. It does to a certain extent. You know, my yeah. my community is oh, under a boil. Yeah. Did I freeze? Mm. There you go. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I back? You're, you're <laughs> back. back. I can't. Yay. I'm back. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah, my community is under a boil water advisory. Um, so there is anger. There's no reason why anyone should be without clean water in this land. And so that, that uh, the, all the broken promises, um, you know, I think what, I, what I've learned from some of my teachers, including the late great Haunani K. Trask, is that righteous anger can fuel so much of our work, uh, not only as writers, but as activists, as, as cultural workers. Um, and we can use that energy that comes from that to create beautiful things, to create beauty, to advance um, our ourselves and our communities and our families. And so that's, I try to tap into that. I try to tap into that anger. I try to, um, you know, I'm not an angry person by nature, um, but I, you know, I don't know how anyone could look at some of the injustices in the world around us and not be outraged by many of them. And so rather than, um, you know, lament it or just stew about it, my, uh, way of coping is to channel it into trying to find ways to create change. Um, and poetry is one of those ways that I try to create change and to put something beautiful out into the world where there is just far too much ugliness. So making art at the same time. What I find really interesting is reading it and I, I and then hearing you animate it and and put breath into it Where, what is that that space that's sort of in between the printed page and oration i guess for a long time i've been very interested in in um in spoken word and not spoken word necessarily just in the way that you know most people would think about what they see on youtube etc but in terms of oratory and you know my grandmother was um also a great speaker kigadons is uh, the anishinaabe word for for uh, an orator or speaker um and so that's part of my family line i come from that you know so i've i've as i've grown up and and um and learned more i've increasingly become interested in that sharing of breath and what happens when we bring um, life to to our words, and I I love the I love books as well the printed page, but I think there's something so compelling about uh, about um, putting something out in the world. You know, uh, sound waves. They they say that sound waves don't ever really um, go away, right? They're they're always with us. They get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, but um, kind of to infinity. So the, that what I was taught was then we have a great responsibility about the words that we put out there and to be careful with your words and so on. And so all of these things for me kind of come together that I want to, um, when I'm reading my poems or performing my poems and my stories, I really want to give justice to the words themselves and to that, that opportunity to, to um, create something on another level with them through the use of sound. And when we're in person, and I hope we will be again soon, um, both with uh, you, Sheila, and with Michelle, um, that we're actually sharing breath when we're reading and, and we're, um, there's, a, there's actually sort of a chemical thing happening where we're sharing the same breath and we're kind of taking each other in and, and putting out something of ourselves. And I love, the idea of that and the sharing of breath just is something that I think, um, you know, uh, brings another dimension to what it is that we can do and how to create relationship and community um, through our words. And, you know, it's, a, it's on a different level, but it's still very, very important to me and I'm sure to other people as well. We have late breaking news here. Michelle found a poem. <laughs> so Michelle, will you, I don't know what your poem's going to be. Do you want to set it up for us? Sure. Um, this is the poem that 
sort of went wild in best Canadian poetry and it, it's called Defying Gravity. And um, uh, I, I think it kind of speaks for itself. I wrote it not long after my son died and I, I, I actually worked, workshop this poem with George and uh, yeah, so it's called Defying Gravity. <clears throat> so many rivers we wandered without helmsman or guide, some so shallow the stones barely below the surface, glacier, sh glacier shrapnel once jagged, now tumbled round and smooth, others honey rivers wide and slow, the breeze rich with warm clover. They made us light in their embrace, these rivers, whether our bodies splayed them open or we lay beside them laughing in key with the timeless rumble of water and stone. If I were a river, <laughs> if I were a river, I would be blue and brown and green at once. Clear as glass, the stone's bright light, a rusty refraction. Would you swim in me again? Would you ride the river inside me as you once did? Could we both be born over in a rushing river of light and hope? I wish I were a river. Wow. Thank you. This poem Thank just you. throws me on my butt every time I look at it. Oh. I, used to, oh, I should have given oh, myself that's... a moment. <laughs> so, so beautiful, Michelle. And thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I know how how close Jay is to you every minute. Uh, yeah. And that that's such a, a beautiful calling to him, that poem. It's gorgeous. Thank you. I know he had a real impact also um, in, in your writing of Five Little Indians, right? Yeah. Well, he really did. I mean, he was... Uh, um, he died the year the year before I created the finished the first draft and but he was so important because you know at a time when I wanted to give everything up just let everything go um, I knew that he was around and I knew that he would be deeply disappointed with me if I didn't continue with it but and then there's the you know there's the cover <laughs> right. Um, you know, I, this is an arc. This isn't the final book, but this is the cover of Five Little Indians. And, uh, um, you know, when we were putting the book together and they were sending me some potential covers and they were like, oh, you know, and I just said, you know, all I want is, uh, you know, something that will sort of signify the gravitas of the story that's being told there. And um, the only thing I suggested before this cover was um, some birch trees. And they came back with this artwork and I literally gasped. I literally became short of breath um, because my son died on the full moon and it was the pink moon. And there we have the pink moon. And it just made me feel like there you are, right? you know, standing behind the artist going, come on. <laughs> so, yeah. So he, definitely has been a part of this and um, continues to be, which is a joyful thing in spite of how my poems can make me cry. So, <laughs> and yeah, but yeah. I think a lot of people listening are very moved by, by that poem as well. And uh, there are a number of comments in the chat, but oh. um, yeah, thank you so, so much. Um, Kateri, do you want to comment? say something to Michelle yeah it's just it's so beautiful and um I know that um he's still he, he's still such a presence and and making his presence known to you and the the poem really captures that and captures the the kind of connection with the 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 natural world and the cycles mm. that we go through um I think it's just such a, a moving tribute not only to him, but to the relationship, the, the idea of being a mom, you know, um, in whatever way that comes to us and for however long 
um, we can be together. And it, it just really, um, it's just so thought provoking and, and beautiful. So Miigwetcha, just, I'm so happy that you, that you read it and you were able to, you know, um, share that with us. I'll be a barely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, usually when I read that poem, I have to, you know, I have to read it through a couple of times and I have to brace myself, right? <laughs> but but I, I did want to share it tonight. So there it is, warts and all. So thank you. Thank you for your comments, Kateri. They mean a great deal to me, as you know. So. Thank you for sharing them with us, Michelle, and, oh. <laughs> and um, for sharing sure. him for sharing Jay with us as well. I I know you've got two boys too, Kateri, and, and I wonder how they influence you and your work. Oh, in every possible way. Um, sometimes it's um, that I have so much less time for my work. Uh, so when I, you know, everything's sort of geared around um, you know, this is going to take me away from spending time with my boys. So I better try to make something worthwhile, <laughs> you know, not to put too much pressure on myself, but, um, I, you know, I, they, they make me see the world in a different way. They, you know, they're dealing with um, struggles that I don't remember confronting in the same kinds of ways. Um, you know, it's been a rough week around my house um, with some incidents happening with one of my sons um, at his school. And, and it's really hard. It's so difficult to watch them go through that. And so they move me in so many ways. Um, and they just, um, they've brought a kind of way of remembering childhood that I think I'd lost a little bit of touch with <laughs> um, before they came along. They just show me this, this joyfulness. And I mean, is there anything better than walking into a room and your children are just so excited to see you? Uh, there's nothing like that. And, um, and that alone fuels so much of my writing and makes me want to leave to them, you know, they make you think about that. They make you think about what you're going to leave behind. And so it makes me want to create beauty that they can stand on for themselves mm. as they, as they create their worlds around themselves. And, and um, they're just very, very inspiring for me in many, many ways. What a lovely way to put it. And I, I have to say, as a stepmother, I can't really think of too many times I walked into a room and my stepkids were overjoyed to see me. But, uh, <laughs> but it's better now. It's better now. But I wouldn't. Well, it doesn't you know, happen every time. <laughs> <laughs> I felt so blessed though to have children in my life because I couldn't have children and you know I I ended up marrying someone who had three and um they changed everything uh they changed my they blew they blew my head up literally and figuratively and I'm so grateful for having had that experience um yeah, it was a, it was a real gift, actually. All, all joking aside, you know, they still call me ESM, which stands for Evil Stepmother, uh, and I th I think that's terribly unfair because there aren't evil stepfathers in t in folk tales, are there? They're always evil stepmothers, and and the stepmothers have to do a lot of work. But um, thank pure you. Pure misogyny. Pure. Yeah, it, well, it is, isn't it? It really is just goes way, way back. And we grow up on these folk tales, you know, it's uh, many in many cultures. It's not fair. It's not fair. Thank you both for sharing your your sons with us this evening. I also want to ask you both about your grandmothers. And and Michelle, I know you're you're thinking about a story that in that is really your grandmother's story as you write your next novel. I think you're you're muted, Michelle. Your your mic is yeah. There, there we go. We, yeah, there we are. How many times you know? How many oh, times in our life, right? Prior yeah. to the pandemic, have we said 
I think you're muted. Oh, I'm muted. <laughs> I wonder how this is going to come out in literature and poetry when all of this is done. Right? You, you are one of the least <laughs> muted people I, I know. But, uh, and I'm so happy about that, too. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So, so the project I'm working on now, my, my next novel, is um, a, a fictional account of the life of my great-grandmother. And she was born in... 1856. Um, I was born in 1956, which I just love those kinds of symmetries. There's just, I don't know, I'm a weirdo, I admit it. Um, but um, she was, uh, you know, my my family comes from, we're descended from the, the Battle River Cree. Um, Miss Tahimasqua, Chief Big Bear, was her brother. And so we are, you know, that that is living memory in our family. And she would have been, I mean, just by extrapolation and historical and storytelling, uh, she would have been present at the Frog Lake incident. I won't call it a massacre the way everybody else does. And so this story is, and she also did not ever see a non-Indigenous person before she was about maybe 19, 20 years old. So what we have in this character that I'm developing around her real self is a, a Cree woman living a pretty much traditional Cree life, mm -hmm. a pre-contact life, even though there was still influence, you know, during her entire childhood and young womanhood, she was completely, her life was completely a Cree life. And, um, and then as she's, you know, going into young adulthood, is suddenly faced with the brutality of the colonial um, violence that was perpetrated specifically against the Cree and specifically against Big Bear because he wouldn't uh, take treaty unless it was as advantageous as it possibly could be. And so her, her story being that she would have been at Frog Lake, um, they were then hounded across the border into Montana through the Cypress Hills into where I am right now. Um, into Montana where, um, and Big Bear and Poundmaker were incarcerated, but where they they were there for many, many years look at, looking for some place where they could settle. And then there was ultimately an amnesty and they were brought home or they were allowed to come home and they were, a box car was provided to bring them back across the border if that gives you any kind of visual thoughts. And, um, and today, to this date, there is a there is a First Nation in Alberta that is known as the Montana Band of Cree. Um, after that, my later, much later, after my grandfather was uh, older, a teenager, but older, he brought her back to Saskatchewan to the Eagle Hills where we're from. And, um, and she lived out her life there. She lived outdoors till she was 80. My grandfather built her a cabin, but she wouldn't live indoors. She told him it's not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Saskatchewan, for goodness sakes, right? Nor you know, like around North Battleford, you know, where 40 below is, you know, sort of, you know. And then two years before she died, she finally moved into the cabin. She was probably saying to him after he, after she died, I told you it wasn't healthy. <laughs> <laughs> so so, um, so the story is basically her story, but it's also the story of clearing the plains. It's the story of the... Uh, you know, unabashed, um, you know, application of colonial violence to Indigenous people in my territory, to my my ancestors. And my 98-year-old auntie passed away just a little while ago, and I I went out to the res, and I, I went to the cemetery, and I visited the rest of my relatives there, and it was brought to the front of mind again that my grandfather was born seven years after Frog Lake. Seven years. And so that this is this is part of our living memory. This is part of our reality. This is these are stories that are still living, you know, in our lives. And and so I wanted not only to tell this brilliant story of her life and what a life it was, but because of some of the experiences that she had had, I want to talk about, uh, or I'm writing about um, how it became uh, acceptable for 
that Indigenous women in Canada and, well, North America generally became disposable and that it was okay to um, inflict violence and brutality of the worst order on Indigenous women. And it's also going to be the story of the close relationship between her and my mother and how her experiences impacted my mother's worldview and her sense of where where she belonged in the world and where she didn't belong in the world. Mm. So, you know, in just very broad strokes, that's that's the story that I'm trying to tell in this next project. Yeah. Wow. Um, the generations, um, mother and, and grandmother. And uh, Kateri, I want to ask you about your mother and, and your grandmothers as well. And, and how, you know, I know that, that they were writing and writers, right? But I, I also don't know if they're still with us, but even if they're not physically present, are they with you? Yeah, always. Um, they're not, they're no longer um, with us here. They, they've, both my grandmothers have passed on. My mom is with me and lives with me. I'm happy to say with my sons and with me. And um, so that's, that's been a wonderful experience. Um, challenging to that kind of negotiate living um, intergenerationally again, in some ways initially, but, um, but it's really been great for, for my sons and for my mom and for myself. And we were especially happy during the pandemic that she was with us. Um, but my, my grandmothers were ex and continue to be extremely influential in my life. My grand, one grandmother was a writer and a reader and so on. My other grandmother um, was a Polish immigrant who had very little education um, and ended up working as a cook, a live-in cook for wealthy families in Toronto. She, she emigrated, when she first immigrated, she was in Winnipeg as so many Polish people come through Winnipeg and then ended up in Toronto working with, um, you know, and living in the homes of the Forest Hill crowd in Toronto, the very wealthy um, old money uh, uh, families there. Um, and so she was um, not as educated as my uh, Anishinaabe grandmother, who was a teacher. She taught in at the school in the community. So that's kind of a, you know, um, most people wouldn't expect that. They would think that my you know, that other side of my family would be more educated, but in my case, it wasn't. Um, what they both taught me was, you know, a love of language. My Polish grandmother loved stories and, um, and sometimes some raunchy ones uh, <laughs> as well, um, you know, and off color jokes and whatnot, Sheila, uh, she could be a bit of a hoot sometimes um, <laughs> and just very outspoken, you know, sometimes to her detriment. But, um, but I, you know, I learned a different kind of way of truth telling from her and, and, um, and a different relationship with language. She still had a very thick Polish accent um, up until, you know, she, she passed away. And my um, and Shabe grandmother, her mother was English. And so she was able to, she's very fluent in English, um, probably more so than she was in Nishinaabe Muin. And she just had this love of literature and books and stories. And she learned traditional stories from her, from her, uh, from her father and from her family members and, and was always um, telling stories. We would have bonfires and she'd tell us stories and we were only, always asking her to tell the scary ones, <laughs> what we thought were scary stories of, of um, you know, uh, transformations and so on um, that as a, you know, as children, we thought were really exciting. I guess they are really exciting, but um yeah, so I learned so much just about language and words and the different ways that that people use language. And I think that's with me. And then just in terms of, you know, the values and so on that they taught me that the teachings they provided to me are, um, are always with me and, and with my children and my mom who lives with us. And so we carry those things in the best way that we can and carry the, those forward. Um, and I hope that, you know, I'll be able to import, impart enough of that to my boys that they'll be able to carry that 
with them to where, wherever life leads them, whatever paths they go down. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's very lovely as you get older to see that, to see how those things get carried forward in families and communities. And so, um, you know, this regeneration thing, it's really, it, it's really become such an important part of thinking about um, who I am and where I fit in, in, in my family and in the world, um, in my community, in my nation, you know, and what, um, what is important? What do I want to carry with me? And what do I want to set down? Sometimes that's just as important. What we, what we put aside and set on, you know, on the road and carry on without it. Um, so those are lessons I'm still learning <laughs> and trying to teach my sons as well. Michelle, you've moved back to uh, to Saskatchewan. I, I don't know. You're not close to to your reserve, to, to your nation, though, are you? Much uh, closer. <laughs> but much closer than, than where you were before in British Columbia, yeah. for sure. Yeah. How, how does it feel to be to be oh. back, to be closer? You know, it's it's an amazing feeling. It just feels like it feels like my ancestors in the land are just speaking right in my bones and saying, well, about time. <laughs> so, you know, it just uh, and and, you know, I'm right at the um, at the doorway to the Cypress Hills, which are a very, very sacred place and also a place, you know, we we tend to think of, uh, um, or like the royal we, tend to think of, of our territories as being related to our reserves. And they're not, they're absolutely not. And the Cypress Hills was a place where my ancestors, I mean, my, and when I say my ancestors, I'm talking about my grandpa, I'm talking about my mushroom, right? Spent lots of time down here for, um, you know, for various, various reasons. and. Um, so yeah, I, I just, um, I'm just kind of shaking my head saying, yeah, why did it take this long? <laughs> why did it take this long? But, you know, our, our lives, I think, um, you know, there were things that I had to do in the places I was in and I wouldn't be, um, I don't think I would be ready for this, ready to come home without all those things that I did before I came home. Uh, I'm, I'm just as happy as a person could be. I, I'm, and now we just have to set up that Maple Creek uh, Literary Festival. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I'm all for it. <laughs> and it's so beautiful. Here. It's so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why, but Howie from your novel just popped into my head because he was visiting his Auntie May uh just as he was about to turn six years old and he was coming in from saskatchewan yeah. i don't know why he just landed in my head i have no <laughs> idea why but but it's such a dramatic moment in your novel and yeah and he may knows this this priest and the priest comes over and he sees this child and he then seizes the child after as soon as he's turned six why is Howie popping into my head? That's a rhetorical question, but there he is. Howie from yeah. Saskatchewan. Yeah. Well, and you know, I have all pheasant. The, yeah. Yeah. I have all these little homage in the book. And I, you know, I had to put red pheasant in there just as a, you know, as a little nudge to my red sisters and red brothers and my cousins and aunties and so on out there. And uh, but yeah, and I, you know, I not only did I want to have, you know, that homage to my own community, but I wanted to talk about how it didn't matter. You know, it didn't matter. You were just like the harvest, the bitter harvest. These little kids were just any, any little brown kid was just there, right? So that the church could, you know, get their clutches into them, get paid to feed them, um, you know, and have the opportunity to do what Bishop Grandin said, which was to humiliate them with the thought of their culture. Um, and, you know, what Bishop Grandin, of course, was, you know, uh, um, end of the 19th century, strong advocate of the residential schools. And, and he's 
basically that's what he said is that we humiliate them when they think about their um, the fact that they're native and when we're done with them there will be nothing native left of them except their blood and you know and I I really wanted to give that sense that that <laughs> it's like these little kids were prey you know they were just prey I mean he was just there visiting his auntie and regardless of his mother's protestations that he'd already they'd already made arrangements for him to go to school at home. She was powerless to intervene, powerless to stop them from taking him. And that, mm -hmm. that powerlessness as it pertains to the residential school legacy mm -hmm. is so critical that people understand the depth of that powerlessness mm -hmm. and that they also understand that those schools were a life and death experience for the kids. Yeah. Kateri, you have a, a poem called The Earth is a Burial Ground, and I, I, I would love it if, if you could read it for us, but how, how it came to be would be, oh. would be great to know about as well. Yeah, um, let me just find it, but um, it Page came four. about yeah. because, okay, oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it came about because, um, uh, there were so many protests that I'd seen, not just here, but in other places in the world where Indigenous people were protecting burial grounds. And it got me thinking because, um, of course, of course, of course, that's very important. Um, but I also thought um, so many of our people are not in burial grounds. Their, their bones are in the earth in other places. And even now it resonates because so many of our children's bones were, some of them are in burial grounds, but some we will never find, some we'll never uncover. And so I started thinking, you know, our connection and our willingness to um, stand up to this colonial machine shouldn't stop with burial grounds, that, that, that all of this land, we have connections, our, the, the bones of our ancestors are all around us. Um, and we have those, you know, those connections um, are, you know, umbilical cords are buried <laughs> in the land as well. We're very tied to our lands. And so uh, this poem sort of came out of that way of thinking, because um, um, I think we forget that even under that pavement, even under that city sidewalk, even under some, you know, uh, mine tailing pit, that's our, that's our earth mother as well. And we're connected to those places in, in our homelands. Um, and they matter to us just as much as as uh, as our burial grounds and as the places of beauty, you know, so-called beauty in in our in our home territories. Um, but yeah, if if there's time, I'd be happy to um, read the poem as well. Yes. Okay. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. Um, this earth, a burial ground. Right here, a child was conceived. Right here, this child was born. Right here, blood skins, bones, and hair. Right here, grandmother dreamed a name. Right here, feet first touched the earth. Right here, a girl once swam the blood tide moon. Bones in the earth. Right here, bones in the earth. Right here. Right here, a boy learned to be kind. Right here, that boy became a man. Right here, someone fell in love. Right here, two lovers held hands. Right here, a heart was shattered. Right here, two bodies became flame. Bones in the earth. Right here, 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 someone said a prayer. Right here, an old man laughed. Right here, children played a game. Right here, a circle made of stone. Right here, a seed began to grow. Right here, cedar, sweet grass, tobacco, sage. Right here, bones in the earth. 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 Right here, Right here, right here, the precious water spoke. Right here, a woman struggled giving birth. Right here, a man wept icicles in snow. Right here, the slow beating of a drum. Right here, a morning song was sung. Right here, a child cried stars into sky. Right here, bones in the earth. Bones in the earth. Bones in the earth. 
bones in the earth, bones in the earth. Right here, a child was conceived. Right here, this child was born. Right here, blood, skin, bones, and hair. Right here, grandmother dreamed a name. Right here, feet first touched the sky. Right here, a girl once swam. The blood tide moon, the blood tide moon. This earth, a burial ground. 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 Bones in the earth, right here. Yeah, absolutely. So beautiful, Tattery. Wow. Powerful woman. <laughs> really powerful. Thank you. It's I wasn't um, really expecting that one. It's been a while since I've done it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I I wasn't expecting it either, but it just came out so so wonderfully out of what Michelle was saying. And Michelle, I, I feel I should be asking you to read some of the novel too, if we've got time. Sure, we have time. Of course, I'm transposing time and Sheila has to leave us at uh, 10 after 6 BC time. Um, and, to get uh, a ferry. Remember get those? A ferry. <laughs> it's very, very important. She has to get back. She's the chancellor. She has to get back for convocation. <laughs> so um, this little excerpt that I'm going to read from the book is um, Bones in the Earth. <laughs> no. Mm. Um, it, it's it's about the struggle that kids had in trying to go home um, after they were released um, or escaped from residential school and how even if they made it home, it was so often not home anymore. And uh, this is about one of my characters, Maisie, and it's uh, her remembering her attempt to try and go home. When they let me out of the mission school, sister traveled with me all the way to Vancouver and put me on a boat that was supposed to take me home. There were seven of us girls from the mission school and another 12 boys and girls from other Indian schools who joined up with us to catch the boat and head back up north to our coastal village. 10 years had passed since they dragged me away from my mom kicking and screaming and it was the last time I'd seen her or my dad. When we got to our village, tired, cold, and hungry, we were herded off the boat in single file. Standing on the beach at the end of the dock were a group of men and women milling around and looking to the dock as we walked toward them. For a moment, the two groups just stood there, kids on the dock, parents on the sand. Then a boy from one of the other schools broke and ran, calling out for his dad. The rest of us ran too, right into that crowd of grown-ups who were supposed to be our parents. We were all pretty much as tall as them now, and everyone was looking at everyone else, looking for something familiar, something to recognize. I didn't know what to do, so I just stood there, hoping one of them was my mom and that she would recognize me. I couldn't pick her out of the crowd. A woman approached me, gently asking if I was Sally. No, not me. Finally, I noticed a woman, her hair wrapped tight in a pale blue scarf, standing at the edge of the group, looking straight at me. I knew it was my mom. Arms open, she ran for me, crying. My mom took me home and gave me tasty things to eat. My dad was out fishing, she said, but would be back in the morning. She said they weren't really sure I would be there that day. The house was smaller than in my memory, but familiar. And the whole evening, I just wanted to cry as I took it all in, the place I'd been dreaming about for 10 years. My dad came home the next morning and held me so tight. He smelled of wood smoke and fish and that primal smell tumbled me back in time to a thin memory of me and my mom meeting him at the dock, him tossing me in the air, me laughing so hard my belly hurt. He would carry me home like I weighed nothing, my face in the crook of his neck, rough sea salt rubbing off on my face. They told me that after I was taken, no one told them where I was. They still didn't know which school I'd been sent to. I couldn't help but wonder if they'd tried to find out. They must have. But the angry question kept rising in me anyway, and their constant affection began to disgust me. I lasted a month. No matter how hard I tried, this place, their house, was no longer home, and these people, though kind and loving, 
were like strangers pretending to be family. I hitched a ride on a trawler to Prince Rupert and took a bus to Vancouver with the hundred dollars my dad pressed into my hand as my mother stood by weeping. Not so long ago, I was at the Balmoral and met a girl from up there. After the expected ritual sharing of who your aunties and uncles are, she told me she was sorry about my mom. I didn't know, but she didn't need to say more. I had so many dreams at the Indian school about going home to her, dreams about sleeping safe in my own room, playing on the beach at ease and without fear, and cooking with her. What I so desperately needed was to be standing on that stool by the stove, carefully stirring under her watchful eye, like when I was little. To be little again, living without fear and brutality. No one gets that back. All that is left is a craving, insatiable, empty place. Well, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for the novel. <laughs> uh, thank you for the story of these five wonderful characters. That's uh, such a powerful section to read. Um, you, you, we talked about this on the air. We've talked about it at a kitchen table too, but you deliberately chose to look at the lives of students after residential school. Why was that, that so important to you? Well, <clears throat> for, for a couple of reasons, but they're really you know, hasn't been a lot of attention played to what happened next. Um, a lot of the work that has been done in literature and nonfiction has been about the experiences at the school, which is really critically important. People need to understand, understand what happened between those walls or behind those walls in what are closed institutions. But, you know, over the course of my many, many years of working and, you know, dealing with the reality of residential school and its impacts, you know, over and over and over, you hear this horrible refrain of why can't they just get over it? Mm. Why can't they, you know, it's history. And first of all, it's not history. It's right here, it's right in the now, it's in our bones that are in the earth. Mm. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and so I have been threatening people for a long time that I was gonna write a book and so I did. And, and a big part of it was to answer that question, to try to demonstrate the impact of that tremendous burden of psychological injury that children carried outside of the schools and how, you know, without, you know, therapeutic intervention, without any kind of support, without anything, they were just unceremoniously dumped into a world that didn't want them. And, I wanted to show how trauma resonates through a person's life over and over and over again, and how, um, you know, and how difficult it was to even create a modest life after that, you know, intentionally brutal experience, that, you know, intentional scrubbing out of our indigeneity, um, that intentional, um, you know, like when, when I speak about the colonial toolkit, residential schools were this key implement in the colonial uh, toolkit to, to uh, not only destroy the Indian in the child, which is a, you know, a phrase that has been used over and over, but to destroy the entire community mm -hmm. because it destroyed or tried to destroy the very fabric of that community, which is in the relationships with mother, with father, with auntie, with grandmother, with grandfather. And to, you know, people think about intergenerational harm in a kind of linear way. They think of intergenerational harm as the children of survivors, mostly in my experience, but it's circular you know, that intergenerational harm is circular in nature. And our experience of residential school was collective as well as, you know, collective as peoples, as well as individual. And, you know, the moment that little child was taken away from his or her family, okay, the grandmother was harmed because her role in passing on indigenous knowledge, teaching stories 
was removed from her. Her mother was harmed, okay? Her role in nurturing and helping this child find a place in her community is gone. The father, the aunties, the uncles, not to mention the community at whole. As a whole, when you think of, you know, 120, 130 years of no school age children in the communities and what that does to a community to be childless, in effect, to be childless and what that does for the future, what it does for our understanding of the past is just such a phenomenal violence that we've experienced. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess what I wanted to do was sort of um, to try to uh, broaden the understanding of what this really meant to us as peoples. Kateri, I before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was was hearing survivor statements, you were hearing survivor statements at, at the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. And I'm sure what Michelle just said, that, that, that essentially this was an attack on love of, of community, of family, for each other, for parents, for children, children to parents. Um, I know you heard those stories. I know you've heard them for a long time. Yes, I have. Um, the, the, you know, the real impact of them um, becomes almost overwhelming to carry, really, when you really understand how incredibly violent the whole undertaking was before a child even stepped foot into those schools, the violence was already underway. And, and it didn't matter whether children survived that storm um, within those schools. People say it was about assimilation and I always dispute that. There was, there was never any plan for when they got out to assimilate them as workers or as anything, really. There was some training for them to do chores and, and learn how to run certain kinds of machinery and farm. But whenever Indigenous people, you know, came out of those places and they were good at farming and they started competing with local farmers, they were closed down. Um, you know, that's part of the history as well. So there, they weren't about assimilation. They were the intention was disruption, dispossession of land, dispossession of resources, um, the layers and layers of violence that were at the heart of residential schools. And that continue now through the taking of children, through, um, you know, the children's aid societies or child and family services, as most of them are now known. Um, you know, they picked up where, where residential schools left off and and it's just a phenomenal um intense level of attack um ongoing persistent attack you know when michelle was talking i was thinking about communities where so many of the children were taken that they really didn't have any children left mm -hmm. in their communities um, the schools were basically empty that's a that's not a hundred years ago. People sometimes feel like, oh, it was residential school. It was a long, long time ago. Well, the residential school era is not did not end that long ago. And when it um, it overlapped with the rising of the child welfare system to take children and and you know do the same kinds of things over again, um, you know. So I I I spent so much time hearing those testimonies, learning more about what happened. Uh, to so many people, things that take away your innocence, even just hearing about them. Um, there's a certain part of who you are that changes forever when you find out what happened to children at the schools. And in the same way that we were talking about children bringing us such joy, um, the taking away of children is, you know, the opposite of that. It, it removes the joy and will and and heart of communities um, and families. And that's the reality of what so many generations, you know, generations after generations of Indigenous people have had to cope with and continue because it's ongoing. It hasn't stopped. Um, the, those, the taking of children is still happening today. And um, I know, you know, I've, I've read 
uh, one of the last things I did for the healing foundation and the legacy of hope required me to sit in a very small room at the offices there and read through files of um, survivor testimonies. Mm -hmm. And I think you can only do that if you shut a part of yourself down. And that's what I did for days was sit in a room reading. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's almost like sacred work to do that, to to take those on and carry those stories and, and know that. Um, carry those memories of that, but uh, it's a, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing for our communities. It's hard to, to know those stories and what happened to children, like the children who, you know, are around us now <laughs> are, you know, for people who are watching and listening, it, you know, the, those children that are in your homes, those are the children um, that were taken from us and, and were affected. And um yeah, it's a, it's a huge, um, it, it's, it's another legacy to carry, but um, a very difficult one to bear. Mm-hmm. It's not almost sacred work. It is sacred work yeah. because you have to have a certain demeanor to hear those in their fullness to, you know, even though you may have to shut yourself down. And I listened to those stories for 14 years, day after day after day um, to not, shut yourself off to, you know, to, to be able to take them into your heart to, to honor those stories is really, I think, uh, it was a gift to me. Um, and something that I carry, you know, with a huge sense of honor that I was able to be witness to those stories and to provide some form of, of support in helping survivors tell their stories. Um, But it is, you know, and when you talk about it, Kateri, we've talked about this before, about it not being assimilation. And it, you know, while there may have been, you know, some, you know, uh, lip service to assimilation, like with Duck and Campbell Scott, you know, I will not stop until they're all absorbed into the body politic and all that jazz. Um, This really was genocide. And, I know that that's a bitter pill for, for, you know, Canadians to, you know, sort of accept that their um, founding uh, governments, the colonial governments were colonial in nature and genocidal in action. Um, But, you know, the genocide conventions define genocide Mm -hmm. and, you know, the genocide conventions of course came out after the, uh, after the Jewish Holocaust and the Second World War. And, you know, there are five definitions. There's been work on on extrapolating from those definitions, but there are five definitions of genocide. And one of them is the removal of one children, the transfer of of children from one group to another. So, and people try to soften that genocide word by modifying it with cultural. There is no such thing as cultural genocide. Genocide is just genocide, and it may have a, a cultural impact, but, you know, it is the, you know, genocide, it means the, the killing of people, right? And that's what happened. These institutions, it is no exaggeration to say that children, little children, little tiny children were, were facing life and death realities when they were five, six, seven, eight years old, Um you know, for example, with 50% of some of the school's populations dying from tuberculosis and the government being fully aware of it and articulating that that in and of itself was not enough to change the big plan. So, and uh, all that information is easily available these days. And I commend it to you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The... um... The way you were speaking, uh, Michelle and and Kateri, about listening and sort of shutting down a, a part of yourself, but I think you you would have to do that to be able to listen. Um, you you I mean I learned a lot as a as an honorary witness hearing uh, survivor statements, especially to shut up and not go up to a, a residential, a former residential school student and, and ask them a million questions, which is 
my nature. But actually one survivor did tell me to shut up, just shut up and listen. And that was the best piece of advice I think I've ever been given in my life. It changed the way I listened to everything. But I also noticed, you know, Michelle, as you were speaking, you kept, you kept touching your heart. And it's so much about listening with your heart. And well, Tracy Lindbergh calls it heart listening. And just, you know, forget about um, speaking through this. Uh, an elder told me that you've got two eyes and two ears and one mouth for a reason. So, you know, rely on the twos, not so much on the one. And the word witness also in Old English, I learned um, from a writer named Kim Acklin, that it comes from inwit, which means a clean testimony of the heart. So the, even the English word is, is really very beautiful, that, that in order to, I think, bear witness, you've got to have a clean heart. And that, for me, that meant not just sweeping my heart, but like taking a Dyson vacuum cleaner to it and just trying to deal with some stuff um, so that I could give over and then try to carry the story. And I, I have to say the story is carried so powerfully and so like you make art, you two, you make art of these stories. And, um, and, and I'm, you know, so many of us have learned so much from your writing, from your publishing also, Kateri, and, and will continue to learn. And I, I think when you see books like Michelle's on the bestseller list for so long and, and, you know, pulling in these awards, but I know what's important to you, Michelle, it's the fact that people are reading it. People are, are taking this into their hearts and, that's what's important to you that and it, I know it also blows your mind and it still does it does but I just wanted to say you know I I had um I guess a mantra um about listening to these stories and and I guess a description of the demeanor that I had to have to to allow it right to to not be lawyerly or whatever, right? To to allow it because very often people would come to me and I would be the first as a lawyer, and I would be the first person that they'd ever told about what happened to them. Mm -hmm. And so, what I came to call that demeanor that I brought to those conversations was making myself small, right? Making myself small in that moment so that all the room that you know, except for my pen as needed, went to, was theirs so that they could have the room, they could have the space and nobody was telling them how to say it, what to say, when to say it, that they could just, I could be small and little in that space and they could just, mm -hmm. they could be as big as they needed to be. Um, but yeah, yeah. I've just got um, a high sign from Charlie, <laughs> I think I've okay. got to go. Um, All right. They're lining up already. So, uh, and I've got to make this one, but um, Michelle and Kateri, so lovely to see you. And I, I want to say thank you for this, this invitation, Michelle. It was, um, it was such an honor to speak with both of you. Well, uh, I'm so, so thankful for you joining us and bringing your incredible skills. I, I really, really appreciate it. I thank you very much. Yeah. My love and respect to you and also to you, Kateri. And I do hope we see Oh, thank you so much. Yes, I hope so. Take good care. Do you have Kateri's book, Sheila? Me. Right here. Yes, yeah. I do. And I devoured it. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. So perfect. Enjoy your fairy. Thank you very thank much. You. And much. we're not finished. <laughs> Yeah. Even though Sheila has to go, we still have some time. And what I'd like to do now is to uh, open it up for questions if people have questions. And, um, you know, and we can, we will, of course, carry on the conversation. Kateri and I never have any problems carrying on a conversation. So, um, so, <laughs> so if anybody has any questions.
I have to say, Michelle, I like thinking when, um, when Sheila says she has to go catch a ferry, um, immediately what comes to my mind is something <laughs> totally different than a boat. <laughs> I just right. imagine her out there somewhere, you know, trying to, to, to capture um, fairies and other magical beings. Yes. It somehow exactly. seems more appropriate. <laughs> well, it's very fitting, very, very suited to Sheila, that's for sure. So, Naomi, you have a question. You can either speak it out loud or you can write it in the chat, whichever you'd prefer. Uh, thank you. And it was really a pleasure listening to that. And um, I hear, Michelle, that you're working on another book and you said it's a kind of fictionalized story of your grandmother's life. And I wonder why you chose fiction in, for that instead of just writing it as nonfiction. Because she was born a hundred years before I was. Right? <laughs> She's actually my great grandmother. And <sighs> But it was the, the same reason that I chose fiction for Five Little Indians. I could have easily written a, you know, a, I'm a lawyer. I could have easily written a, a nonfiction tome. But fiction gives a, uh, provides a latitude that you don't get in nonfiction to tell the truth by not being tied to certain facts. And uh, while a part of this, the historical part of this, is going to be completely factually correct in terms of the history of that time of clearing the plains. I am, I am creating my great grandmother as, as she exists in my heart and in my imagination. Uh, she was dead before I was born. So, you know, there was, there's a certain necessity to that. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're quite welcome. Um, does anybody else have any questions? But we could talk about that too, Kateri, about the power of fiction over nonfiction. What do you think about that? Um, you know, I think of them as, as doing sort of very similar things, but sometimes quite different things. As you said, when you write fiction, it allows you to get at the truth without sort of... Um, having to stick to the facts of things, which sometimes get in the way of the storytelling. So, um, you know, well, well, a certain amount of that, you know, things like, like uh, the, the uh, testimonies that we were talking about earlier are so important. But um, I, I think often what poetry and what fiction can do is take the truth of those things and um, they open something inside people through the, the language and, and, and so on that resonates with people and allows them to listen. It allows them to use those two ears that Sh Sheila was saying and, and <laughs> you know, um, not to speak against it, you know, like we're so quick. Um, I think so often um, in Western society, we're taught to like be formulating our arguments while the other person is speaking. So we're not fully listening. And I think um, poetry and, and fiction allow us a little bit of breathing space to be able to put those truths forward in a way that allows people to kind of slow down and, and listen um, in a different kind of way yeah, uh, rather than sort of um, actual accounts. Yeah, it's like essentializing, essentializing the truth. It's like taking from you know, factual realities, the essential truth, and putting it into, you know, the very powerful um, fictional expression, the artistic expression. Um, and yeah, because I think, you know, fiction and nonfiction, as you say, you know, they, they play different roles. Nonfiction can be deeply moving, um, especially creative nonfiction, and even academic history. I mean, nonfiction can be very moving. But what nonfiction gives you is that creative license um, to, to go to work on the essential truth and to make it so apparent that nobody can miss it. Um, and nobody can, uh, you know, like you say, nobody can, can mount an argument. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's not in that venue where someone's going to argue about it in terms of whether this happened on this day or that day or whatever. Um, it just essentializes the truth in um, in a way that can be beautiful. And, and I think that opens the storytelling to a, an even broader audience, which I think is really what we're trying to do, um, is to, you know, 
have as many people hear these stories that are in your poetry, in my work, and all the other Indigenous authors that are working so hard. Yeah, so. I think too, we can take those, um, if we're, you know, if we think about survivors' testimonies that we've both heard and, um, you know, we can, instead of somebody else having to read, you know, dozens of them to, to understand something of it, we can sort of act as a, almost a filter to be able to take out those things that um, we think will capture people's attention and get them to understand um, you know, in ways that they might not be able to access otherwise. Yeah. I think it's a, um, often it's a, it's a much more accessible way for a wider range of people to, um, to, you know, to um, read poetry and fiction rather than to go through those kinds of reports or academic papers or other forms of, of nonfiction writing. Although some of it can be beautiful. I remember reading Hanani K. Trask's book of, um, of essays for the first time. And I cried when I read it. And when I told her that when I first met her, um, she gave me a hug and it's like, there was a level of understanding between us. And we just became fast friends after that. Um, Cause it, that it, it was about putting the heart into that kind of writing as well. But there's not a lot of, <laughs> I haven't read a lot of academic writing that makes me cry. Um, either, or, right? or if it does, it's for other reasons. <laughs> So, all right. Uh, okay. <laughs> we were told we had till 8.30, so I'm just moving along here. Um, are, are, are there any other questions right now? And if not, then um, uh, I will leave it to Mark to, uh, to wrap up the evening for us. Does anybody else have any other questions? Okay, over to you, Mark. I, I have some. I have something I'd like to say, yeah. if that's okay. Um, I just wanted to thank you so much, um, Michelle. I, I was able to be here with you when you first started on this path with Green College, and and I'm here again. And um, it's really been an honor and a joy to be able to talk with you about these important issues. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for that, and for Green College to create the opportunity for us to get a chance to to, to um, hang out together and to talk and to hear each other's work and Sheila being part of it was just in, an incredible addition to that. So um, Chimigwech, thank you so much for including me in, at, at both the front and uh, um, part of this and, and here as you're winding down your tenure with, uh, with Green College. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I really, your contribution has been so important to the whole thing and I really appreciate it. But um, I think Sylvia had a question, maybe not. Her hand was up and now it's not. So I'm going to leave it at that and I'm going to hand it over to Mark. But before I do, I'd, I'd like to say that this has been a real journey over the academic year. This is our, our final one and it was really so beautiful to have us three women doing what we do uh, together. It, it really meant a lot to me and the whole thing has meant a lot to me. So thank you, Green College. Thank you, people that have been tuning in for every single event and some of the events and this you know, event for the first time and make sure you check out the YouTube channel so you can see the previous um, events that we had. And with that, I'm gonna miss my Tuesday nights, I gotta say. Well, Michelle, we're going to do what we can to extend your tenure with Green College by, 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 by any means we can discover that will be congenial to you uh, because you're so good at this. Um, my only regret, once we'd appointed you as John V. Klein lecturer, was that we weren't, as it were, also appointing you as you know, writer in residence. Um, and that had as a consequence that we didn't always get as much of you reading, I've said this before, from your own work as we might have liked but I just stand now awestruck once again by the skill of Sheila Rogers, who managed to elicit a poem from you this evening, apparently without any preparation, um, mm -hmm. which was a beautiful thing to behold, along with all of the other beauties that the three of you women brought to our table this evening and for which we are also tremendously grateful um, for the honesty, the clarity, the, the power, and the, and the beauty 
uh, of uh, the work that you presented and the, indeed of the conversation that you've had. Um, it's little wonder, I think, that there's not a great sequel of, of chat or Q&A for this. There are occasions, and not only on Zoom, um, when one really just wants to shut up and ponder what, is, what has been said. And I think probably I can speak for a whole crowd of us now, 30, 35 or more, and people who've already left the room to ponder by themselves. This has been uh, a, a wonderful hour or so that we've spent uh, with you and a great way to wrap up a series, which uh, Kateri did indeed help to launch. And that's another measure, not only of Kateri's generosity, but of Michelle's skill in crafting these kinds uh, of affairs. So warm thanks to the three of you and the two of you presenters still on screen. Uh, my thanks too on behalf of the college, to all those of you who've joined uh, these events over the weeks. So a heads up that in two weeks time on Tuesday at Green College, via Zoom or in person, if you'd like to be here, uh, Richard Vidan will be talking on the series on uh, psychological effects of intergenerational, intergenerational trauma, specifically about his experience as someone whose grandparents, great grandparents and father were, uh, as he said, attended residential school, though that verb seems wrong to me. Attention and attendance are things one freely gives. Um, anyway, that's Richard Vidan in two weeks time and our writer in residence, poet Margaret Christakos, will make her debut uh, at Green College via Zoom the following Thursday, uh, the following Tuesday, which is um, November the 30th. So we will have other readings um, and we look forward uh, to hearing Kateri, Michelle, any of your guests and company, anytime you like, whatever kind of tenure we can extend to you. That's all for this evening. Thank you all very much. Be well, be strong, be safe, everybody. Goodbye. Good night, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night.